Where did the idea come from? So the idea came from this, I quite like the idea of maybe somebody who's really famous, really, you know, a national treasure. Have they sold their soul for that? And, and this idea of having a choice, you know, that when it comes to it, somebody who's got the world, you know, would they give that up for their, for their family? You know, and there's a quote which we use sort of on the post, you know, every parent has a, has a favourite child, you know. And it's, it's sort of based on all of those things, really. So what do you think? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting taboo, that, because we've, we've brought that into focus. And the more I talk to parents, I'm not a parent, Paul is, but parents say, oh, you're so right, he's my favourite, she's my favourite, they're my favourite. And you, you do that, you actually put your hand on your mouth and go, really? But then I go, I go back through my own family, I think, oh, yeah, I think my dad, I think my dad liked my younger brother best, you know. It's silly because it's paranoia as well, but there was an element of truth in it when Paul brought the idea to me and I thought, that's really rather good to explore. Um, and mm. I'd just written a play actually about two twin sisters who were warring and it was based on a true story. So again, I think I, think I love that, that idea that, that family is the factory in which we are created. And on every factory line, there are, if you like, flawed goods, rejected goods, broken goods. Um, not without being too heavy, I think it's a really interesting ex exploration for a writer to come up with this thing about the, the favouritism within the parent-child relationship, but also play it against this backdrop of celebrity culture, which of course everyone's really interested in, and we live in an age of, of adherence to the celebrity culture myth, if you want to call it that. Yeah, I was going to ask you if there was a warning in the film. Obviously, you work in this industry, um, but, it, you know, there's... Well, it's, it's really interesting. The week we were filming this, I mean, I won't say which celebrity it was, because I think some people might watch this and think, oh, this is about that celebrity or that celebrity. We were actually filming this before those two big stories um, came out and it, it actually broke one of those really big stories of, of the last 12 months, I won't mention, um, came out when we were filming it and we were all like, wow, this is, this is incredible how, how relevant it was. And it was, it really was, wasn't it? Yeah, I think, it, I think also there, there, there's, a, there's an element to the story which is, it asks the question, do each of us have a price? Do each of us, would each of us put something before the well-being of someone else to get what we need. And I think every drama, it, well, I know every drama is predicated upon what characters need. Their needs are paramount to the story, to the narrative of that storytelling. Um, and most needs are pretty accessible, pretty identifiable. With this one, it's, if you like, uh, well, it's a choice, uh, <laughs> but it's a Hobson's choice. It's a Sophie's mm. choice. It's one that puts the audience in that very important predicament what would I do? And I think that propels the drama, yeah, really. Exactly. It's full of twists and turns as well. But I think that that's the thing that was most important mm -hmm. to Paul as a director and me as a writer, a co-writer, to get it into that shape where you'd sit there going, what? What? What, oh, what would I do? What would I make? What, what decision would I make? What choice would I make? You've had a really lovely cast for this. Did you kind of give them a lot of direction or did you let them bring what they wanted to do to the, to the roles? Uh, Especially maybe for a little bit Alex. Both, really. I mean, Alex came totally fully formed with that character. Alex is, is known for a lot of roles, but he's never really played an out-and-out, I'd say, baddie or just pure evil. I mean, he's just he's pure evil in this film, and I've certainly never seen him that. And if you know him, and he's, he's a very good friend, friend of, of Tim's, you know, he's not like that at all. He's lovely. He's the sweetest man. And you watch him in this film and he's like, oh, you're, you're just pure evil. And, you know, I think he loved it. I think he absolutely loved it. And Rita, I've worked with a lot, and Rita's a brilliant very actress well. and she was just so focused in this. You know, we, we were very lucky to get the two of them and they just, they just clicked, didn't they? They absolutely did. And I have to say, Paul's right, I've known Alex... Alex was in my first feature, which is called The Hyde, and he was wonderful in that, but I've known him for years, and I watched it from the sidelines. They forced me to be quiet, and um, it was uncanny because I, I ceased to know either Alex or Rita at that point. They became their characters, and it was an amazing exercise in minimalist, minimalistic mm -hmm. acting. Um, and I know Alex has said to me for years, oh, write me a baddie, write me a baddie, I want to play a, want to play a despot or a villain or a, you know, and he's, he's got it, and he is very 
uh, understated in his performance, which I think gives it an even more threatening or sense of menace that really propels his, the narrative and his character, especially through that film. I think there was another star in your show, the music, the sound effects. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Do you know what? Yeah. Oh, uh, amazing. Uh, Ethan Lewis Maltby is the composer, and he did, he's done my last, I've done uh, three short films and he's done the music for everyone and it's, it's incredible. Yeah. And he just comes up with it all. And you know what? I hardly have any notes for him at all. It's literally like, yes, that's it. <laughs> he gets it straight off. And um, once again, very lucky to work with him. And, and I really appreciate you saying that because it's great that you notice that because, it, it, you know, in most films actually, music helps so yeah. much really just setting that tone so thank you for saying that that's fine I, it really stuck out to me i've got one more question for you was there some supernatural what or not i couldn't work out i i, I couldn't decide i guess a little bit i mean you know it's as with a lot of things you have to it's it's in the eye of the beholder i think you know a little bit who is he he's made a you know she's obviously made a deal with somebody who's who she made a deal with well that's for the for the viewer to decide i would yeah, say yeah it's funny i remember a lovely old quote and from it was a singer who said I, I i got what i wanted but i lost what i had and that surely is the root of the faust impact that is the ethos of the faust impact that suddenly you're prepared to sacrifice something to get what you want as i was saying earlier and we pushed it so that it was a darker thing that it was something or somebody that had something powerful that somebody else wanted to feed off and was able to provide that nourishment, if you, if you like. And, of course, Alex's character does that. I'm not going to give any games away. Mm. But, uh, but Rita plays against that, too. So you've mm. got a clash. And I always think, because we're quite interested in the whole celebrity culture thing, I think it's quite interesting to think of certain performers who think life was easier when it was boring, mm. <laughs> perhaps. Yeah. Or, or I wish I could walk down the street yeah, without being bombarded by tennis balls. And, and the grass is always greener, that idea, mm. you know. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's not always as good as it seems, I guess. Thank you very much. You've been brilliant. Thank yeah, you very thank much. You, no, thank you for talking. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah.